and we're live here on a Monday afternoon. Hope you guys had a great holiday weekend. Um, mine was relaxing, couldn't do much here in South Florida as uh, everything was locked up. Let me just check my levels, make sure everything's five by five. Um, yeah, looks like we're all good to go. So, how was your weekend? What'd you guys do? Not much. Couldn't go to the beach. Luckily, we have a pool here. Um, so, we basically just hung out, dodged the rain, uh, and decided to just make fun of it and spend some time with the wife and watch some movies since there's nothing new. So, we did some binging, watching the new, uh, not new, but the uh, Jack Ryan series on, on uh, was that, Amazon? Yeah, that was that's pretty cool. Just, just got into that, binged everything else over the last couple of months. So that's where I am with everything. So what I want to talk to you about today is we're not dead and we're not going to be dying. And I'm going to be talking about how protests are a waste of time financially. Yeah, I said it. I'm going to be the one who, who who's going to go there today. Um, but first, as we do every single weekday here at 530, Today was a little bit late because I had some things to take care of, but we're going to go to the board. And so the board tells us very quickly here, uh, everyone's been screaming and crying about how the corona has been so horribly bad and we're all going to die here in South Florida. You've, you've probably heard it yourself. Ground zero. This is the worst place ever. But before I get into here, I want to share a couple things with you. This is really important, really important for you to understand where things are headed. So this here is from the CDC, Center for Disease Control. And I'm going to refresh this so that we can go down to the bottom and see if they've updated it yet. This is the, the most recent information. And I want to show you where things are headed because, again, I know you're not getting this information. And so why am I sharing this information, first of all? Because we're here about making money in real estate. I want to do deals. I want to do deals with people who are looking to uh, buy and sell property here in South Florida from, you know, whatever part of South Florida you're in. I'm looking to do deals. This weekend, I, I put up a video. I spent some time going out to the Opportunity Zone in Delray. I'm going to make a future video about that. That was amazing. Absolutely amazing. And it lived up to its name big time. It is full of opportunity. Um but I'll go into that later. So let's just talk about this right now. So this is the most recent data for last week. And if you scroll to the very bottom, this is where it gets real important. And this is what people don't want to tell you about. But I'm going to blow this up and show this to you. And it says that right now, as we speak, is my head in the way? No, you can see it. You can see it pretty good. It's this block right here. The deaths, the actual deaths from the coronavirus have dropped so low, we are at the threshold from being removed from epidemic status. Not my data. I'm not making it up. I'm just showing it to you if you know what to look for. You can turn off CNN, MSNBC, Fox, all of them. They're all screaming at the top of their lungs about how we're all going to die and how we all should be locked up forever. But when you start looking at actual data and educate yourself, do some edification, some personal edification, you can see here, right here, we're at 5.9%, which is barely above the threshold for what would be considered an epidemic. I'm thinking once they update the information, you're going to see people screaming on the news. They're going to try to discount this because we are about to go below epidemic status. Um, there's been some articles written. Here's one. COVID-19 is close to losing its epidemic status in the U.S., according to CDC. And then the number here is right here. Normally, normally. Now understand, this is this is not something new. Normally, we're at around 7% with just regular flu stuff uh, to 5% during the, you know, the non-virulent months. Winter. So, I mean, summer. The latest data shows that we are at the epidemic threshold of 5.9%. Once it dips below that, all the screaming has to end. This is no longer an epidemic. You might get sick, you might not get sick, go to work, open up. It doesn't really matter. We're going to have to live with this. 
It's something that we're just really going to have to deal with. You have to get your big boy, big girl pants on and understand we're going to be living with this like we lived through the flu, like we lived with HIV, like we lived with emphysema and tuberculosis and every single other disease that was out there. Who knows how they have quantified this? I'm not going to get into mixed numbers. The bottom line is people aren't dying. They can't mask that. You're going to say, if it, again, if you're a conspiracy theorist, conspiracy theorist and you're saying, oh, they're fudging the numbers and, and you don't believe anybody, just go ahead and disconnect here. I'm not, I'm not into uh, conspiracy theorists. I've seen enough of people post the same information that I'm going to talk about, but they leave off the most pertinent part of it. And that's when we go to the Florida dashboard. And so when we go to the Florida dashboard, everybody, everybody and their mom talks about the escalating cases in Florida. And here in the yellow above my head, you're going to see how many cases per day. And I'm really going to blow this up because the more you blow this up, the more it really brings into focus what's really going on here, really what's going on. So these are the cases in Florida. If you go to the next page and you're like, oh my God, now you can see this and move my head. Now you can see this in all its glory. I want you to look at this. And this is this day here, we had 8,800 cases. This day here, we had 9,500. Uh, this day here, we had 9,500 again. This day, we had 11,000. This one was almost 10,000. You, you, you're seeing what's happening here? The cases have just been skyrocketing going nuts and this is what you see people posting all over twitter all over facebook as florida is the epicenter there's just so much stuff here right now we're all gonna die they keep saying that just keep looking at that but now i'm gonna show you what they never post i challenge you to find it they never post this and it's as simple as looking at the very next page uh oh rut row that's the death number. These are the death numbers. These are the numbers nobody ever wants to talk about. These are the numbers that people completely freak, about, freak out about because they don't want you to know that we are basically almost out of the epidemic stage. But look for yourself. 50 on, July, on June 23rd. 33 on June 24th. And so on and so on and so on. On the second, 26 people, 15, 12, 9. You want to shut the economy down for, unfortunately, a couple hundred people dying in the last month in a state of 21 million people? Of course not. Absolutely, of course not. We're being lied to on a grand, epic scale. The only way that you could say to yourself that, this doesn't, this doesn't work, Barry. This, there, there's got to be more people dying. And, and we've heard it enough. Wait two more weeks. Wait two weeks. Wait two weeks. Well, let me ask you a question. So if we go back here and we say here, uh, on June 25th, there were 8,900 people who got the corona. Well, we're at the two-week stage right now, aren't we? You take 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, 30th, and so on to now July 6th, we're at the two-week stage. So what, what, what's going on? Two weeks later, and nobody's dying. In fact, it's dropping off a cliff. You can just take the trend line and just go do this, and it's dropping. And it fluctuates. It'll go up and down. We know the numbers go up and down, but nowhere near. Nowhere near going crazy. Nowhere near chicken little status of everybody dying. So can we all just understand we're going to live with this? That we, we just have to put the big boy and big girl panties on and say, we're going to have to live with this. If you're sick, stay home. If you're afraid, stay home. But the rest of us are going to go just go ahead and live our lives. Can we, can we all agree on that? Can we stop the nonsense? Can we stop the utter nonsense of, of trying to make everybody feel like we're all going to die? Can we get back to doing some business? You know, I don't care one way or the other. Personally, I'm already going to continue doing business. As I mentioned, I was out this weekend at the Opportunity Zone and saw a bunch of properties. Those properties were amazing. And I'm going to look to buy. 
am uh, filing the paperwork tomorrow to start a fund. And, you know, it, it's just going to be awesome. So I'd rather we just go ahead and put this Corona stuff behind us. The only reason I talk about it is because I get so many relatives and friends and potential buyers and sellers who don't know what's going to happen. So they're kind of afraid and we know what fear means as warren buffett it says time to be greedy when others are fearful time to buy when blood is running through the streets so the more fear porn that they can go ahead and, and publish and put out there the better it is for us the better it is for anybody who's involved in real estate or real estate development right now the more fear they push out the better the better we're going to be able to negotiate because they have to either come to grips with it or the follow up on their own terms if if they truly fear that shit's gonna hit the bed or is hitting the, hit the fan is it is, <laughs> shit's hitting the fan then you have to act accordingly that's more buddies texting me right now saying hey we're all gonna die no that's that's my buddy under talking to me about you know, how lucky we are to be in south florida that's what i love to see we're, we're lucky to be here in south florida so I'm not going to talk about that anymore. It, it's today. I may come back to it. Let, let's talk about what I posted about today. And, and as a black man, this is kind of hard for me. One of the things I said is that protests do absolutely nothing for the black community. And if you've watched over the last week, especially this past weekend, we saw tragedy beyond tragedy. We saw, what was it, like 70 people get shot in Chicago. We saw 50 people get shot in New York. We saw an 8-year-old little girl get gunned down. We saw a 19-year-old young man get shot and killed. All black. Every single one of them black. We've seen more people killed this weekend in black-on-black -black crime than we've seen the entire year and I'm talking 12 month year, not just since the first, killed by policemen. Yet we're seeing people protest and we're seeing people run in the street and we're seeing them tear down monuments because they want police reform. How about some self reform? So today, it, this may seem a little bit pointed because I'm gonna talk to my black friends and uh, people in the black community I mean, one of the hashtags I follow, which is really good, is a hashtag called buy back the block, hashtag buy back the block. There's some people who've got some great ideas, and it's basically telling young black men and women, stop running in the street and putting your energy behind people who don't give a crap. None of the politicians that you have voted in, I won't say none, I won't use a superlative, but most of the politicians that you have voted in in the last 30, 40, 50 years have done diddly crap to help the black community. There are still communities back in Connecticut when I was a kid that were ghettos that if I went back today are still ghettos. There are still probably family members who become legacy dependents. They're, they're still using food stamps. They're still getting... Wick, they're still getting Section 8. They never got off the treadmill. They never got off the plantation that they willingly. These weren't people who came over on a boat and chains and had to be pulled over and whipped and everything else. These are people who willingly stepped up and go, um, yes, sir, can I, can I get on this plantation? Can you take care of me? You, you hear that today as well. With every demand that some of these protesters are, are giving, they're talking about, can you take care of me? We demand you give us this. We demand that you provide us with reparations. We demand that you somehow give us the information, give us the money that you owe us. I haven't seen one set of demands and I'll call them demands. I haven't seen one set of demands or policy or objective that says enlighten people as to how to create wealth. 
Have you seen it? Have you seen anything in any platform by any politician, by any protest group that has said, show us the way to get to the next level? And then show us how to get from that level to even the further next level. Have you seen any of that? I challenge you. You won't see it. Everybody wants to give me. And that's the, the mindset and the ideology that's going to set them up for continual failure. There is no equity in a protest. You are not going to develop equity in a protest. The, the, the fair playing field, the level playing field is already here. There's no reason to fight for it. There's nobody who's going to stop you from moving forward except the people who you supposedly follow, the ones who you say are going to lead you. They're the ones who are going to stop you. And that's whether you're white, black, brown, red, yellow, I think I got them all covered, queer, whatever. Doesn't matter if the people you look to don't lead you to a path of equity. I didn't say equality, I said equity. If they don't bring you to a position of understanding what equity means and how to become viable, then you're just going to keep spinning your wheels. You see, I was lucky, very lucky. I was a product of a immigrant Jamaican man who came here um, with his brothers and started a construction company um, in the early 60s when there really was racism. And they had an old Jewish guy who helped them and got them going. And they started building. No, first they started renovating, and then they started building, and then you know they built themselves up a pretty good business. This sustained their entire families. And back then, in the seventies, when my dad was getting million dollar contracts, there wasn't there wasn't people. Yeah, there was. There was people who were again calling him a coon, like they've called me a coon. And that's just because of the ignorance and misunderstanding, because they don't understand that you can actually achieve, that there's nobody holding you back. So I want to talk to those people who understand that there is opportunity. I'm going to talk about the Opportunity Zone this weekend, which, you know, when I went out there in Del Rey, it blew me away because what the city of Del Rey obviously did was get out there and bulldoze a bunch of empty or what was property and bulldozed it into empty lots and now they're saying hey Barry and other developers can you come on in here and rebuild this we don't want you really to gentrify it we'd like you to bring in some affordable housing and help this area you know all this blight we took care of the blight we, we just bulldozed everything down yeah there's still some board ups and some horrific units there but for the most part, it's just land waiting to be, you know, tilled, per se. And why isn't anybody from the actual hood doing this? I'll tell you why, because none of their leaders have shown them. You know, with these kids dying this weekend, well, they didn't die. They were murdered. With these kids being murdered this weekend, check and see if you saw Maxine Waters or John Lewis or Al Sharpton or any of the aforementioned leaders telling them, hey, don't do that, and we've got a better way. Nope. There's always an excuse. I'm done with excuses. I'm done with excuses. So, if you'd like to understand how to take it to the next level and become equitable, building equity instead of equality. Equality is, is, is not something to attain. It's a road along the way. If you're always looking for equality and I want to be as equal as this person, well, yeah, I'd love to own a jet. I'd like to have a jet. I'd like to have a 10,000 square foot home on the intercoastal. I want to be like he or she. That's that's being, you know, equal. How am I going to get there? You know, you want you want I don't want anyone to give it to me. I just want to have the opportunity to have the equity to buy into it. See that difference there? Being equal with somebody says everybody gets the same thing. It's a mantra. It's Marxist. It's communist. They keep using the word equal, equality, equality. There, there can't be equality in America. There are going to be people who clean. There are going to be people who sweep. 
And there are going to be people who own the buildings to employ the people to clean and sweep. There's nothing wrong with that. No one says you have to be a sweeper or a cleaner all your life. You could start as a sweeper or a cleaner, and then you'd learn how to move up. You learn how to build equity. We're all equal. I'm, I'm no different than the person cleaning. I'm no better. I'm no better than the person who, who has to come and, and scrub toilets. I'm no better. I already am their equal. That's where the problem is. They keep searching for equality. And that's the mantra that's killing the black community. Nobody is talking about equity. And, and I don't know why, except for the fact that politically it makes more sense. It sounds good to say we're all equal, but the only way their equality is met is by telling you what you have to give me. It's absolutely ridiculous. Excuse me. So how do you get equity? Well, the guy I talk about a lot is Warren Buffett. And look at this article. This article was from, and I and you, it could be easily could be from right now. It could easily be from today. And what it says here is something that every single person should aspire to understand. I'd buy up a couple hundred thousand single family homes if I could. This is from the wizard. This is from the the Oracle of Omaha, as he's called. But look at the date. The date on this was September 13th, 2013. That was the updated date. It was originally posted on February 27, 2012. Do you know what happened in the real estate market back then? Look it up. I lived it. Dropped off the planet. Single family homes, you couldn't find buyers. People were in bad straits. The savings and loan debacle had just exploded. I think it was something like a third of the savings and loans across the country folded. Countrywide, gone. People stopped making loans. Market tanked. And he said, I'd buy up a couple hundred thousand single family homes if I could. What would you do today? You see, the market is still not at its bottom. You know, if you look at a bell shaped curve and it looks, and let me just draw that bell shaped curve looks like this and goes like that. We're right here. It still looks good for the stock market, but in real estate, it's starting to hit. I've showed you some things in the last week or so about how we, we may see more foreclosures than we've ever seen in the last couple of years. It's going to get nuts, people. It's going to get nuts. So let me play a video for you. If I had a way of buying a couple hundred thousand single family homes, I would load up on them and I would I would take mortgages out at very, very low rates. Let me, let me go ahead and play that again so you guys get the idea. If I had a way of buying a couple hundred thousand single family homes, I would load up on them and I would, I would take mortgages out at very, very low rates. So if Warren Buffett would buy as many houses as possible and rent them out, if that's a prescription he's giving, what would you do? I mean, to me, I'd make sure that I'd follow someone who, who's got that kind of advice. Here's another piece that you may want to hear. If I was an investor that was a handy type, which I'm not, <laughs> and I could buy a couple of them at distressed prices and, and find renters, uh, I think that's, uh, and, and, and again, take a 30-year mortgage. It's, it's a, a leveraged way of owning a very cheap asset. Now. I'd buy distressed properties. I'd find renters. And I'd make sure I get 30 year loans. Think about that right now. I'm going to dig into this this week. This, I just wanted to use today as a setup, just to set up where we're going for this week to help you build some equity. And buying distressed property, there's a key to it. And that key is 
being first, being there when it's, when it's time to actually buy the property. You see, once it hits the foreclosure market, they're going to be, it's going to be so competitive, you may not even be able to play. There's a lot of people who have backdoor arrangements with banks. I know you're not supposed to, but sometimes the banks call us directly before it even hits the market and says, hey, take a look at this property. Let me know what you think. So how do you get there before it gets to the bank, before the bank repossesses and pulls the chips in? There's a key to that, and the key to that is what I'm going to show you over the next couple of days. But as Warren said, buying these properties and putting tenants in them is the gold mine moving forward for at least the next 12 to 15 months. Why do I say that? Well, when there's a ton of foreclosures and there's a ton of evictions, it doesn't mean that the people living in those foreclosures and homes that they're being evicted from are going to vanish into thin air. They all need a place to live. Good people survive bad situations, but they only survive bad situations if other good people help them out. And with what's coming down the pike with the, the election and where things are headed with single family residential homes, um, it's going to be a massive opportunity for anyone who wants to get involved in the single family housing market. So talk to people who are doing this protest and out there waving signs and try to get them to understand if you want equity instead of trying to strive for forced equality, do what Warren says. I mean, the guy's he's brilliant. He's a billionaire. He's done everything that, you know, someone could want to do. He's a sage. Why are we not listening to him? Why are we not implementing the things that people do who are successful? Like in a movie with Will Smith, how do you do it? You know, what do you do and how do you do it? What do you do and how do you do it? Why aren't people asking those questions? Why aren't those people saying, hey, listen, Barry, Fred, Warren, how do I get to the next level? How do I, how do I get out of my mom's basement what do i need to become a, a a property owner what do i need to become a landlord how do i get successfully build wealth for my family well you listen and you and you listen to guys like warren buffett and i'm going to show you more about that over the next couple of days so i'll see you guys tomorrow if i was an investor that was a handy type which i'm not <laughs> and i could buy a couple of them at distressed prices uh, and find renters, uh, I think that's, uh, and, and, and again, take a 30-year mortgage. It's, it's a, a leveraged way of owning a very cheap asset.